Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, Cranked and Ranked. We, we took a little bit of a break, but now we're back, and uh, it's time to start ranking things that we cranked. Uh, for those Hell of you, yeah. Who, yeah, for those of you who are new uh, to this podcast, we essentially rank rock and metal related things, sometimes band discographies, sometimes other whatever topic we come up with. Uh, uh, today, we are going to be doing our top five favorite albums from a particular year. And I am Stephen, a.k.a. Old Head. And with me, as always, is Mr. Eddie Sparks. Hello, sir. Tonight we're going to party like it's 1999. Oh, yeah. Do, 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 do. <laughs> That's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to party like it's 1999 because we are going to be talking about our top five favorite albums from 1999. Now, I stress the fact that I am using the word favorite because these are not the best. Anyone who does a ranking and considers it absolute, they are morons. <laughs> we, <laughs> we are not those people. We have our own opinions and our own, our own uh, relationships with music. And so I think we both know that our lists are not going to be the same as many other people's lists. And so this is just a fun conversation. We are, um, you know, from two different eras. You know, I was born in 78. Uh, Eddie was born in 98. Yep. So 20 years. The, so the year before the year we're talking about, you were one year old. You were barely probably crawling at that point. Yeah. And uh, and all these <laughs> albums we're going to be talking about were coming out. I was 20, 20? I was 20? Was I 20? 21. Yeah. 22? So oh, I was yeah. born in 78, so I would have been almost 22, I think. I don't know math. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's <laughs> this is this is, let, let's not do this anymore. Let's get right into it. Before we start uh, our top five albums of 1999, do you have anything you would like to say about the year 1999 in general? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, my list is not your typical 99. What you would expect of the era, so. Okay. Funnily enough, right off the bat, I can say there's no new metal in my top five. Oh my god! <laughs> you're you're and right. I like, you're right. I it's like not a very 1999 well. list. That's the thing. Like, I do like a lot of new metal kind of stuff, uh, but it, the albums that I picked are fr kind of from bands before the late nineties. Oh, still okay. So still putting out albums. I got that, but that's probably yeah. a good thing because I, I think between the two of us, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Cause it, when it comes to these year episodes, I feel like we do that. Sometimes we match up other times we grab from different areas. And so everybody ends up happy in some way, I hope. So let's, let's just not fuck around with it. I'm, I'm excited to do this year, even though this is a year compared to the other ones that we've done. This is a year that, if you were to ask me, you know, is not, was 99 a great year for music? I'd be like, eh, not really. Because, you know, my the shit that I love is all mid-80s to mid-90s. And then after that, it gets a little iffy. But once we dove into this, this was uh, very enjoyable to go back and listen to some of these albums and discover that some of them have grown on me in a way that I didn't expect. So uh, let's just jump right into it. And as always, I'm going to let Eddie uh, start off with his number five from 1999. Okay, so my number five for 1999, and bearing in mind, this is my favorite band. I've gone for S&M, Symphony and Metallica. Oh, we're in, oh, okay. I didn't even I did not even include that because it's not a legit album. But I, I'm going to allow you to do that, sir. S&M. Thing, thing is, he, he, here's here's where I kind of stand on including like shows in our, our lists if it has something that separates it from being just a straight up live album at least audibly um say an unplugged gig or playing with a symphony sure uh, i i consider it legitimate for like this kind of of setup so like yeah. a top five of a year well i mean once again it's it's all how you feel about it and it's uh it definitely was i remember at the time 
Um, I wasn't totally excited about S&M, and it's one of my least favorite Metallica releases, but that's saying a lot because they are also my favorite band. So um, it was a big deal when they did this. So, yeah, let's go ahead and hear your two cents on this album. Cool. Yeah, you know, I, I really like this show. Uh, similar to the Unplugged gigs we talked about with Nirvana and Alice in Chains, it's different enough. But this is... I just really like the way that they reimagined the tracks. You know, some sound better than others, but songs like Call of Cthulhu are, you know, really elevated by having an orchestra there, yeah. in, in my opinion. You know, I will actually confidently say the best version of Call of Cthulhu is on here, from what I've heard. I still need to listen to um, S&M 2. Did they do Call of Cthulhu and S&M 2? I don't remember. I've only heard that once. Um, right. Uh, but but I have to admit, I, I think the the orchestra inclusion works best on their instrumental songs. Yeah. Because um, sometimes the, the my problem with both S&M recordings is that sometimes the vocals don't seem to go like he'll be singing and the, the there'll be some weird thing happening on the strings where it's just, and I'm like, okay, yeah. that doesn't need to go there. Cause you're kind of, <laughs> you're fucking with the vocal. But, um, I, ha sometimes I have to, to divorce myself from the original songs in order to just listen to it and go, okay, can I do that? Because I've heard a lot of those songs hundreds yeah. and hundreds and hundreds of times. So it's like, can I, listen to this with fresh ears and see does this go but it's really hard for me so it's like a real rough listen for me yeah it and like like you say it's it's really on the instrumental parts where the orchestra actually comes out of its shell but when it's kind of battling for like who's actually carrying the melody here it can get a little bit you know eh, that that's a little overplayed yeah but you know it it's still metallica nailing their hits and some and some deeper cuts too uh nonetheless seeing as it's a live album it clocks in at the bottom of the list for me because i wanted to include you know the more original stuff at uh further up the list but yeah. um and what's the as a, what's the name of the original there's two original songs on that um uh no leaf clover no leaf and clover yeah that's a good one minus human as well that's the one that I always say seems like it's an unfinished song. Like it's yeah. good, but it seems like they just threw it in there. But that's also something unique about that is that the, the No Leaf Clover, I think, is a great song. And that's the only place it's ever been recorded. So, yeah, something about that. They didn't do that on the I, guess, I think they did No Leaf Clover on S&M, too, but they didn't have any new songs. Mm. Which is which I think would have been cool, but eh, whatever. I mean, it's Metallica. They. They do whatever they want, and I usually eat that shit up anyway. <laughs> they did. They did do a really cool reimagining of um, "All Within My Hands," that was yes. like totally, totally different to the um, fucking Saint Anger version. But yeah, yeah, it's good. I mean, I like the I like Saint Anger anyway, but I like the the uh, the I like also the the stripped down, unplugged versions they've done of some of their songs too. Like the I don't I don't know why. Those work for me for some reason because they change them up a little bit. Yeah. So I think them. that's why All Within My Hands, I think, works so well because they didn't just straight up do the song with an orchestra. They did a different version of it. Honestly, <laughs> imagine... I think it would be more interesting to hear an orchestra play Metallica songs alone. Like yeah. That would be kind of cool. Um, mm. But I don't know. S&M's great. Have like Lars at like the back with a gong or some shit, <laughs> and they all just become parts of the orchestra. <laughs> I was gonna say, can you imagine if they they kept the um, kill 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 part in like the really nice stripped back yeah. kind of <laughs> acoustic setup? <laughs> I don't know why you didn't do that. <laughs> Funny as shit, but um, I, I yeah. do I do like that they don't shy away from that album they still occasionally play saying anger tunes here and there not often but yeah that that makes me happy that they don't just do what other bands do and be like oh we fuck fuck that album we're never going to talk about it you know so that's, and that's cool. the thing i will maintain that you know the 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 biggest problems with saint anger are not enough 
quality control, I would say, with how long the songs are for how much is going on in them yeah. and the production. I feel like length paired with odd production choices really make the album suffer. But um, there are there's some really promising riffs on that album. It could have been an excellent groove metal album. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, but hey, history... but that, didn't, that didn't that didn't come out in 1999. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, um, so this happens sometimes where we digress from <laughs> um, the topic, but I don't know. That's that's how conversations go. Where if we're, if we were two two dudes chatting at a pub, um, I don't we wouldn't be sticking to, to a topic anyway. <laughs> so, um, you got anything else to say about S and M? Other than the fact. It, it's cool to see them doing something so uh, so big and so ambitious. Yeah. But uh, it does have its shortcomings, but when it shines, it shines. So uh, that's why I've put it at number five on my list for this 1999 episode of Cranked and Ranked. Totally cool. All right. Um, so, my, so I'm going to go ahead and, and knock this uh, new metal shit right out of the gate. Um, <laughs> New metal to me is something that at the time I was not really into. Um, so I, I guess the albums that I've included on here, I was kind of into, but overall I feel like that's a sound that in 20 years to me has become, I don't know if it's a nostalgia because I was, you know, I was, I wasn't young then, but something about it is, is uh, there's an endearing quality. There's something about it that just feels fun and um yeah dif- different like it doesn't yeah I, I i i i guess the history of it all is is kind of made it a little more interesting to me but um my number five album is from arguably the best new metal band um the album issues by the band corn hey and this one is one of two albums on this list that i would call growers ones where at the time i liked them but over the years to me have become much stronger with repeated listens and everything. Um, Issues was Korn's fourth album. And at that point, Korn were fucking huge. Yeah. Like they were rock stars, probably as big as you can get. A- and this was a real, um, cause I, I wasn't really that into Korn, although I, I liked songs off of each of the first three albums. And I actually bought this one when it came out because of the strength of the the first single, which was falling away from me. And I was falling like, oh, this is away from me. Yeah, I just like <laughs> sometimes the groove of it all feels so good that it, it, you just get swept away in it. And I think that this entire album has that quality. And I think it's one of their most focused and consistent albums because other albums I think have a push and pull. Maybe not. I don't know a lot about the, the latter day corn, except for maybe the last album, which I really liked, but um, it seems like their first three, they had high moments. And then there, it seemed like they, there was a little bit of a still figuring out who they were. And I think by the, th- th- by the time they got to issues, they, they were really good at being corn. They knew yeah. exactly what they were doing and they had honed in everything and they made this really solid album. And um, the production is really great. Um, you're going to hear a name a few times uh, in this episode and that name is Brendan O'Brien. Yeah. Because he, in 1999, produced everything it seems <laughs> <laughs> but he did really he did a really good job like brendan o'brien i think is most known for working with pearl jam i guess like that was a big deal for him i think he also did crack the sky by mastodon i think that was also a brendan o'brien album wow. he's done a lot of good shit but he he has a way of uh getting across a real thick sound from a band without sounding overproduced and that's that's what the corn album is one of those things. I think we've talked about the groove before. When a groove is so good that it forces your head to move. Yeah. And that is the entire album issues right there in a nutshell. And the whole band is just totally locked in with each other. They're, they're, I mean, 
a few of the songs, uh, the, the, all of the single songs are great. Like Beg For Me is great, Make Me Bad, Somebody, Someone. Those are all really strong songs that over the years have become favorites of mine with Korn. That I liked them at the time, but they come on now and I'm like, God, this, is, this still sounds so good. Yeah. And um, I really do think, especially now that I've gone back to listening to some new metal and revisiting a lot of corn the i feel like the corn formula or cornula as i'm going to <laughs> <laughs> coin the phrase the corn formula can be a little bit deceiving cuz i think on the on surface level it sounds like corn's just doing corn songs oh this is the this is the the way the riff goes. This is how he sings this point, and then this chorus pops in here, and that's how it goes. But sure, they had a bit of a thing where they kind of had their little map of where they were going, but I think that it's deceiving because there's always something interesting and unique going on within the song, whether it has to do with an odd drum pattern that the drummer's doing or uh, you know, if the bass line. What's that? What, is Fieldy the bass player? Is that his name? Yeah. Um, yeah. That guy... It stuff sometimes does some really interesting bass lines and then yeah. guitar melodies. It could just be a melody that flows along the song, or it's just the particular uh, effect that they're putting on the guitars or something for a particular song where they create a mood. And so it's, it's, there's so much going on in, in a lot of corn songs that it's easy to miss. And a lot of that is in issues. And that's another big thing that, you know, from 1999 until now, you go back and listen, and I'm like, man, there's so much good shit going on in here. And these guys had a lot of great ideas, and they were riding the wave. Like, they were the, the momentum of them being successful doing this music that overall doesn't sound like anything that should be hit music, you know? Yeah. In fact, they're riding that wave, and they're just being themselves, and, and it's just such a fun album to listen to. So uh, my number five is Issues from Korn. Awesome. I mean, we've we've already got like two two different eras, kind of bands off right out of the gate. Oh yeah, yeah. We got early '90s with Corn, and then '80s with Metallica, and then coming into 1999. Yeah, that's true. Cool. So uh, my number four. Mm -hmm. uh, I I am suspecting this is it will be in yours as well. But, well, let's see. California by Mr. Bungle. No comment. I'll let you know when we get to it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, yeah, my number four, California, Mr. Bungle. It is an absolutely wild ride with mm -hmm. these oddly soothing moments juxtaposed with Bungle's patented level of insanity. <laughs> yep. And it's, it, it's definitely their most accessible album, uh, but it still has that absolutely nuts vibe that we love the band for. And it's it's amazing. I've never seen a, a, a band have a more crazy evolution from album to album. Like, even in their demos. But here is, like, the last album of the original run. And you can tell they were kind of... The previous album was like straight up wild experimentation, just throwing every weird ass idea they possibly had at this slab. And now here we are and they're kind of like, we want to kind of do like a pop kind of thing, like a 50s, 60s Hawaii kind of vibe, but with like this crazy Mr. Bungle way of doing things. And it's it's just such a mind fuck, but it's it's one that kind of lulls you into a sense of security at the same time. <laughs> yeah. The, that's an interesting thing about Mr. Bungle is the fact that even if they decide to go with a particular theme that they're going to put into the each song on an album, it's done in a way to where that may not be the theme you pick up on. If the album wasn't called California and didn't have the album cover that it did, those elements may just be like, oh, this is more weird bungle shit. So, yeah. Because they, they, 
they can do anything and they incorporate any element into a song at any moment that they would like to do it. And I, I, I think it was, um, Trey Spruance, there was an interview with him and he was saying that at the core, Mr. Bungle has always been a metal band. And to someone like me, that's what I get because it, almost not every song, but uh, it, every single album has metal elements in it. And yeah. if you focus on those, you're like, Oh yeah, fuck. Yeah. They're, they're a metal band that has decided to stretch their wings and do weird shit and take on any influence that they could possibly think of. And so I think that's really interesting because I think depending on who's listening to Mr. Bungle, it may be a completely different view on what they were actually trying to do, like where the base is. So mm. that's I, I, that's what I love about them. That's the thing. I, I once heard uh, Mr. Bungle referred to as uh, Primus on steroids with less bass. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, there's a little, little bit of that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like that kind of weird, out there, proggy kind of feel, but just done with so many different influences and of course you know you've got mike Patton on board there's going to be a big Patton influence yeah on it because he is just an absolute fucking soundboard of a human being but he, the, he the, can... the interesting thing though about him is that if you go back with the history of mr bungle and the guys in mr bungle they kind of taught each other yeah like they like mike Patton wasn't a good vocalist right out of the gate trace bruance wasn't into metal necessarily. And so it was almost like these guys, they were such an important band and so important to each other because I think they all propped each other up and they all became these, uh, and Trevor Dunn, the bass player, um, they all became to me, amazing musicians. Yeah. And in their own right, Mike Patton just has more, he's done more stuff and he's more in the limelight than the other two, but all three of them are just people that I look at and I go fucking a man. I, I bow down to all three of you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <They're> all great. <laughs> and, uh, it's at this point I'll, I'll mention new bungle album. Go and fucking go and fucking listen to it by, yeah. by it. it is fucking phenomenal. And I know this probably goes against everything we've said so far about re-recording your material, but <laughs> this is one of those rare occasions where, do you know what? It really benefits from it, especially having Dave Lombardo and Scott oh, Ian on yeah. board. You know what? I like, can actually talk about it because I was going to hold on because of my, I have an album review of this coming out, but by the time this comes out, the album review will be out. So, um, you, you, if you if you saw it, I, I did a review of the new Mr. Bungle album, and I it's 15 minutes of me uh, coming all over it. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it is so fucking good, and I love the fact that they went back and embraced where they started. Yeah, and and it's so good. But but I, I won't go too much into it because I I'm sure if you did watch the video, it'd be me repeating myself. But I love it and. Honestly, I hope that they like new material would be cool, but it would be awesome if next year they re-record re-record Bowel of Chile. Yeah, uh, you know what I'm saying? Because that now yeah. the, the, they they move over because like it, within a year they went from this crazy thrash death metal to ska influenced things. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so I hope they do that. But but you know what? We I, already I'm very happy with what they've done. On the demo OU818, there yeah. is one song at the end that didn't make the album, the, the debut from 91. The rest of the songs on that album made the cut, apart from this one at the end. And there's an awesome little, like, funny skit at the end where they left in a blooper of them recording this funny audio clip. And it it's nice to hear like a human side of Patton every now and again. I mean, I know people tend to think of him as this like God, but you know, you just hear him recording. I really mean that much to you. And then cracking <laughs> up laughing just because he's like, he can't take it seriously. I, I did. I just saw an interview with him that was done by Eric Andre. Oh, and I watched it too. It's phenomenal. It, that's, that's a, that's nice just to see a fun interview with Mike Patton. Yeah. With, with a dude that 
clearly is a fan, but isn't trying to be all, I'm going to try to prove to this guy that I know a lot about music. It was just yeah. them riffing, and that was a yeah. super fun interview. I think the coolest thing about it is as well, they're both known for being batshit insane, so they kind of <laughs> cancel each other yeah. out. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, California. Anything, yeah. anything Anything? else to add about that one? Uh <laughs> oh man how do you uh, how do you end an album better than that oh, uh, one of my standout moments on that it, i can't remember what the song is called but it's like midway into the album and i love whenever whenever metal bands play eastern shit i fucking live for that that um yeah that's that's the one yeah. i think it's i think it's it, it's the title is in italian i think and i've never been able to to pronounce yeah. it yeah i just i just love it, that kind of scale i that's, just it just that's how speaks i am to me as an american level. i just see words in different languages and i just go i'm gonna call that track four <laughs> <laughs> awesome cool. so uh well, Without um, further ado, so, so yeah, the, 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 I, I love that album. But yes, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna play my hand and say uh, it is in my list, but not yet. Um, <laughs> my number four album, just in my memory, when this came out in '99, um, aside from you know from the Mr. Bungle album, this may have been in '99 the album I listened to the most. But it's, it hasn't. It hasn't remained in my, you know, rotation in 20 years as it as I thought it would, but it's fucking killer. Um, the album number four by Stone Temple Pilots. Holy shit. Is um that is this is a killer album. And it's what was it there? I mean, I guess there's their fourth album. Um I loved it at the time because I was a big fan of core. And a very big fan of of Purple, although I don't know if it's is it actually called Purple or is it just a self titled album? I've never re- been able to really. Assess it's called that. Purple. And then they did that songs from the Vatican gift, gift shop, shop or whatever it's called. Yeah. And I liked that, but it was it felt at the time like they were kind of turning away from who they were. Yeah. And number four, they come right back into it. You listen to fucking down the first song on that album. That is that is core style heaviness. It is even today. I crank that up, and I imagine what it would be like to be able to play a song like that live to a crowd because it's just it's heavy, it's riff tastic, Mm. and the I don't know Scott Weiland sounds great. He still does like like you notice that. Uh, between the second and third album, he kind of changed up his vocal style a little bit. Yeah. And he still has a little bit of that here, but it's almost like he's meeting in the middle mm. of, of who he, who he was in the beginning and who he was on Vatican gift shop. But the, this album, just the start of it, the one, two punch of down into heaven and hot rods. It, that is a fucking amazing track one and track two. The mm. album is just filled with great songwriting and performances and the vibe and the energy of the album is so it's a band that I think at the time, a lot of people were like, Oh, Stone Temple Pilots, they're probably almost done. And they came out with this album and they were like, ah, uh, no, I guess they're not fucking done because there's just so much good shit on here. And it's uh, obviously, I think the, the biggest hit off of it was my least favorite on it, which is sour girl. Sour which is girl. <laughs> yeah it's which it's a good song but it's it's you know not my favorite my favorite is probably the song no way out which is another real fucking heavy song and it's got mm. like like scott wyland had that thing he had a he had a, a a mojo like a groove thing that he would do where he his vocals sometimes just felt like an, an another another uh, percussive instrument along with being melodic just the mm. way he would deliver certain things and in no way out it's got that part where he does the uh give it away now motherfucker now keep it away like yeah. that you know? <laughs> and every time that part comes i'm like oh it's so good it's just it just feels good in that part of the song and the uh the one thing that struck me when i listened to this album again now this album does not sound like it came out in 1999. 
So you, you go back and listen yeah. to like Core and Purple. They sound like early 90s albums to me. This, I don't know where number four fits because it does, it has not aged in a way that makes it feel dated. It just, I don't know what it is. The songwriting and the production, I'm going to say the name again, Brendan (laughs) O'Brien did this album too. (laughs) So I, I really like how this album just has, it's a killer album where they acknowledge where they were. It has elements of their first three albums and it sounds fresh. It, to me, it's their last really good album. I think they did one other with Wylan after this. Yeah. Uh, oh, actually, I think they did two because they did, uh, what's it called? Shangri La Di Da. And then they did that self titled one in 2010. Oh, I don't know if I've heard that one actually. Maybe I should go back and check it out. They also did a covers album too, I think. Yeah, they've done two self-titled albums as well, which is confusing as shit. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah, number 4 is uh is it it still sounds really great today. So I don't Hey, it's funny. Number 4 is my number 4. Look at that. <laughs> um but yeah, I it's it's uh, I can't really say much more about it. It's one of those things where if you're if you like Stone Temple Pilots, you probably enjoy number four because it's just a solid album from a band that I think, sure, they were popular, but I think that they do deserve more credit than they got because I would rather listen, when it comes to the volume of their output, I enjoy more Stone Temple Pilots albums than I do Pearl Jam albums. So yeah, <laughs> um, so even though I do love the first like three some of the fourth Pearl Jam album, but I think overall I get more out of, of Stone Temple Pilots. And I know that they're lumped in with Pearl Jam sometimes, which it, it's kind of dumb, but whatever. But yeah, anyway, yeah. great album. Number four by Stone Temple Pilots. Cool. And one last thing I want to say about Stone Temple Pilots. Mm-hmm. People, people that call them a post grunge band, yeah. wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're wrong their debut came out in fucking 92 when grunge was in its full fucking peak as we discovered as we discovered last time it came out the same day as dirt yep so there you go they didn't have, they didn't have in that much time to to, to rip anyone off according yeah, yeah, to yeah they, they didn't says. have the internet at their at their fingertips to hear all this music that was going on and start ripping it off you know they, yeah. they didn't <laughs> it's just great minds thinking alike really exactly um so yeah that wraps up number 4 for you i will say that that number 4 album by Stone Temple Pilots is, is an album I've grossly neglected over the years because oh, yeah. I I kind of like I actually only came on board to it like this year. Um and like I love I love core. I, I love purple. Um Tiny Music was where it started to veer off into like a completely different style. And I was like, I I agree. They do feel a little bit like ah don't don't stray too far from what makes you you. Yeah, you know, and but then they come straight back with like an all-encompassing album. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, I think that the, the the especially the beginning of that album. Like whenever I've thought about, whenever I've put out music, and I always sequence songs. I always look at albums like this where it begins with Down and Into Heaven and Hot Rods. Just the way that that one flows into the next one. I'm like, that's how you start a fucking album. Um, yeah. yeah, there you go. Awesome. So this one brings me to number three. All right. Now, now this one could get me some fucking pitchforks and torches. Don't worry. I'm gonna take the. I'm gonna take the big hit for you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I. I don't know. I, this one's. This one's pretty out there. Okay. I've gone for. Risk by Megadeth. All right. No, I love I love that you put this in here. This is great. Okay, so often considered one of Megadeth's worst albums, I disagree as I like it a lot. It's a different flavor with some serious experimentation on it. And to be honest, it just puts me in a good fucking mood. Like, yeah, it's pretty much a radio rock album, but I think Megadeth just added another style they can play to their catalog. You know, songs like Breadline, 
Crush Em, I'll Be There, Wanderlust, they're all, it, it's pretty much everything else on the record shows us a much more rock-oriented Megadeth, and honestly, I'm glad that they did this, so that if I want to hear Megadeth do a sounding nice and friendly in a major key, I can I can listen to it here. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I think that this album, it, it's, a, it's weird because I think it's unnecessarily shit on because... Yeah. It was it was such an obvious attempt to broaden their audience, which is fine. Like any band, especially going that long, you gotta take some chance to take a risk, as they called the album. Yeah. And and it's just one of those things where for those of you who've listened to this podcast for a while, you know the thing that I love is when a band does something different, even if it doesn't connect. And that's why I think Risk is so good because you just in the discography of Megadeth, the album is interesting and it has, it feels fresh. And I don't think, you know, it's not, it's nowhere near my favorite Megadeth album. And some of the songs I think are pretty bad, but overall I, I, I just think it's, it's, un, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a, a little thing in here. I don't understand why this album doesn't turn people off to Megadeth as a whole, like the Black Album does with Metallica. Like people yeah. go, Black Album, fuck Metallica. But the Black Album doesn't sound as much as a money grab as Risk does. <laughs> so so if you're going to yeah. call sellout, you should just fuck off right away. Because, you know, if you're going to if you're going to point those things out, then Risk is exactly the example of that kind of thing. And, yeah. and so I've always thought that's really interesting. It's so, it's so interesting when a, a band can earn, earn a reputation that pretty much makes people just forget that they did albums that people don't like, <laughs> you know, Yeah, <laughs> like we were talking about with Judas Priest. It's like people just totally ignore Turbo and they're totally fine with it. You know, it's like, <laughs> whatever, we just don't talk about Turbo. <laughs> they just sweep it under the rug. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, it's 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 like you say, people that you know dog on Metallica for the Black Album. This album has a fucking disco song on it. So, <laughs> you know, my only my only gripe with this album is is the unnecessary third track interlude that cuts off and and didn't need to be there because it, it it's kind of like the damn it, crush, damn it kind of thing that appears later in that song anyway yeah. and if it if it built up to that in the song then it would be fine but it just builds up builds up builds up and then cuts off and then goes into like immediately just cuts off hard cut right into you know, just like I was made for love. Wow! Oh, yes. <laughs> Someone needs to do a mashup of that. That'd be fucking awesome. I was made for crushing you. I was. I was made for crushing you. <laughs> okay, Dave. <laughs> We we need to we need to put together at some point a compilation of all the noises Dave has made on like the records. It would be so funny to just hear all <laughs> of like the like screams and snarls that are just pure Dave Mustaine. Yeah. But yeah, that is um that's risk. Is, and, that, is uh, all you it's all you have to say about risk? I I just wanted to say as well, I think I read somewhere or at least heard somewhere that it was initially intended to be a Dave Mustaine solo album. I th I thought but, that was the wor world needs a hero was supposed to be a solo album. Oh, was it? Yeah, uh, I don't think I don't think this one was supposed to be. I might be wrong, but I don't I don't think that's which the case. is which is strange because that one sounds way more like Megadeth than this one does. Yeah, but like, I think this one, if when I when it, it, when I read Dave's autobiography, I think at this point was where he fully admitted that he was chasing Metallica and trying to make a hit song. <laughs> yeah. and he was obsessed with it which it makes sense but i don't fault him for that because if you if you're a musician that's that's um achieved what dave mustaine had already achieved with megadeth why would you stop trying to achieve things why would yeah, you exactly. why would you stop trying to make another goal 
And mm. so if his, if his goal happened to be making something accessible that could cross over, uh, I, I've never thought that that was a bad thing. I have no yeah. problem with bands reaching across and trying something a little different. Even if it's an entire album, it doesn't matter to me. So I, yeah. so that, yeah, I th- I, I'm glad that you put risk in here. Cause I think that's an album that needs more love overall. Yeah. And I think nineties, nineties Meg- Megadeth as a whole needs a lot more love because people are so quick to, you know, obviously they're thrash stuff, fucking phenomenal. But, I like the direction they took f- f- as of Countdown and yeah. the, the way they explored that through the 90s, incorporating different kind of styles and stuff, ultimately culminating in Risk, which kind of caused a reset on the following album. Yeah. But th- this whole 90s Megadeth ride is is a wild one, and I would highly recommend it to anyone chronologically as well. So you get Rust get to Countdown, then Euthanasia, then Cryptic Writings, and then Risk is just a hell of a fucking experience. Yeah, I agree. It makes it makes a discography way more interesting, especially for the kind of thing that we do. So whenever we get, yeah. to, Meg- when we get to Megadeth, that's going to be an interesting one to, to pull apart. Really looking forward to that one. Yeah. But yeah. Cool. So um, I, are you done with Risk? Yep. I I am done. I'm done okay. taking risks. So just in case you thought people were chasing after you with pitchforks, I'm going to go ahead and save you. I'm going to jump in front of the pitchforks <laughs> and I'm going to go, wait, I got one for you guys. Follow me this way with your pitchforks. Oh, um, damn. My number three is the album Significant Other by Limp Biscuit. Hey. <laughs> I, I would be lying if I did not admit how much I love this album. And I didn't, I liked things about it when it came out, but over the years, it's one of those albums where a song will just randomly come on and I will go, Oh, oh, this is good. I'm going to turn this up. I'm going to turn this up. And, and it's dumb to deny how good it is. I I mean, it's also kind of a dumb album too, but, (laughs) but, but that's kind of um, its strength as well. Is it? It's kind of, it is kind of like a resurgence of shut your brain off party music that was huge in the 80s and then following the whole grunge thing where everything was stripped back and taken quite seriously. By the end of the 90s, it's logical to think that people would want a more up-to-date version of, you know, snorting crack off of a stripper's butt. It's now yeah. shaking your shaking your booty to a fucking rap rock riff (laughs) yeah and honestly there weren't a lot of bands that did that because very quickly shit became um uh uh, lincoln park where it's just like oh god this like that's the thing is people would talk about how oh with grunge it was just so they there was just no fun involved in that music i'm like no 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 it was the new metal shit that really started to get boring with like yeah. we're we're all very sad and and hurt people and I'm just like and they I it just that overall that period of music it's really hard for me to get into some of it because it's so uh self-serving I guess it's so yeah. like me 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 kind of music and Limp Biscuit to it it actually takes that idea because if you're talking about hip hop hip hop has always been about bragging um, like sure things yeah. got more socially minded as, as hip hop moved on in the like late eighties, but it, you go to any like classic hip hop albums from the eighties, it's all them rapping about how they're the best rapper. Yeah. And <laughs> they, and so Limp Bizkit kind of took this on where sure, not all the songs are just about how great they are, but there are some songs like that on this album. And the one thing I got to point out is that, uh, um, uh, audibly or what i don't know what the term i'm looking for orally what not, no that's that's a mouth <laughs> he, he, orally a u r i don't know what, what what it sounds like the production of terry date yeah. terry date's a guy that he worked with pantera and i like the pantera albums he produced but they're they're usually to me too treble heavy this album might be the best produced terry date album there is it sounds wow. amazing. The band sounds fucking huge. So this is the second Limp Bizkit album, and after this came out is when they fucking blew up big time. 
I, mean, I guess they had already blown up a little bit because of the cover of Faith they did. But this is <laughs> it, it's if you I, I feel like if you can't hear the great performances on this album, like just let's take Fred Durst out of it for a minute and let's just think about the rest of the band. Like 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 none of them are virtuosic performers, but they're mm. all very good at what they do. And this album is nothing. There's literally not a dull moment on, the, on this album. I enjoy every single track, and I like that it's not supposed to be deep, like you said. Yeah, it's it's a party album. You put it. I mean, you can literally put it on at a party, and it sounds absolutely appropriate. And I think Fred Durst gets a lot of shit unnecessarily because I think that ju- ju- okay, I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes I don't like a band just because of their fans. And I think yep. I think Limp Biscuit fans ruined it for Limp Biscuit. So I think <laughs> that people associate Fred Durst with these douchebags that were fr- that were fans of Limp Biscuit. Now, I, I realize that Fred Durst put on the persona of a douchebag kind of in his performances and stuff, but he acknowledged the shit. Like, they did a, a, a tour where at the beginning of their performance, he crawled out of a toilet bowl. Yeah. <laughs> so he was very aware of what they were doing, and he just didn't care. He was just They were just doing what they did. And I think, I mean, he's not a good lyricist. He's not a good vocalist. But it is almost like he's playing a role in the band of like, hey, I'm the party dude in this band that's making this party music. I mean, maybe I'm giving Fred Durst too much credit, but some I people feel would like, say I am. I feel like he was the hype man for another MC, but the MC like <laughs> fucked off and he kind of had to take on the role. Like, <laughs> Yeah, the real vocalist couldn't make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Fred, Fred Durst gave it his best shot. Um, and uh, I don't know... J- also, um, I I don't think John Otto gets enough respect as a drummer because mm. I like drummers that hold down the groove and Same. have a really tight pocket. And John Otto is like that. That guy, I love hearing his drums. You can just play, even though he's not doing anything flashy at all, it, it just sounds so good to me. So really, if you break this album down, aside from my opinions and how I feel about it, it was a big deal. And all of the fucking singles are great nookie break stuff rearranged in together now which was the the thing with method man which that's yeah. fucking great that they did that sounds like a wu-tang song on a limp biscuit album and at the end of the day like uh, like when i first started compiling my list i thought to myself this uh, limp biscuit might be number one for for 99 it might be <laughs> Um, the more that I really like objectively thought about it and and compared albums and and my history with albums, I'm like, okay, well, I can't let this have number one, even though out of all these albums in in the year 2020, I listened to this album more than any of the other albums on my list still today. And I think it's I don't know, I it's, it's past time for music like this to get more respect and the only way that's going to happen in my opinion is for people who don't like it to stop talking about it so yeah you read reviews of albums like this and it's literally like the dude that really loves bob dylan has been assigned the task of reviewing (laughs) limp biscuit and i'm like dude (laughs) get the fuck out of here you are this is not your music you don't it's like it's like reviewing it out of context it's like Somebody who thinks The Godfather is the best movie ever made reviewing uh, an Adam Sandler movie. And I'm like, you don't (laughs) fucking get it, dude. I would rather watch any Adam Sandler movie over The Godfather because it's more enjoyable. And that's the point. The point is what the movie is made for and the intent of it. And most, most reviewers, I won't say all, because I think there are some out there that are, that have their shit together, but if you're taking it out of context, yes, this is a shitty album. <laughs> if you're comparing <laughs> it, if you're comparing it to to Blood on the Tracks or whatever, you know, for just picking on Bob Dylan, but Bob Dylan <laughs> seems like a guy that people that try to talk like they know about music, they always throw in Bob Dylan. But um I just think that that does it a disservice. There's 
if you don't like this kind of shit, fine. You don't have to come to this party. Yeah. We, we, you, you go you go to your own sad sack party and we're going to be over here with all the ladies shaking their boot booties. I don't know why it's, <laughs> the word booty sounds so weird. Me saying it, I don't ever want to say it again. Um, and so, it's, so yeah. So at the end of the day, it's one of those albums that if you are down for the ride, this is great. If you're not, that's cool too. We'll see you later. <laughs> you know. So, um, but yes, I, I'm sure the pitchforks are all coming after me now. In That's a weird, in a in a weird way that that people wouldn't think about because stylistically they're so different, but the vibe is so similar. Hair metal and new metal are much more connected than people think. In From, some in some bands, yeah. In some bands, like especially Limp Biscuit, because the same stuff that people went after Poison for are the same things that people go after Limp Biscuit for. It's like it's not deep, it's dumb. And I, I also enjoy Poison, and for those very reasons, yeah. it's not supposed yeah. to be deep. It's it, exactly, and it, it's like you say with the whole Bob Dylan analogy. If you're if you're trying to if you're going to break stuff with the intent of like hearing this story of a, of a man who's traveled like a thousand roads, you, you're not, you're not, you're not going to want to hear a guy going, I pick a chainsaw. I'll skin your ass raw. Yeah. If my day keeps going this way, I just might break your fucking face tonight. Like that it felt, in itself. It felt good. Even you doing the vocal part. Yeah. I don't even need the music behind me. I already feel fucking hyped. You know, actually, you know what? After this, I'm going to binge all the Limp Biscuit albums. Just, well, I mean, maybe not all of them. But. <laughs> not all of them, but the essentials. Um, I, well, I don't know. I think overall they had pretty solid output. But, I mean, we're, we're going to do a, a Cranked and Ranked on them at some point just because I like talking about them. I mostly yeah. just like, I like talking about <laughs> albums and bands that people don't respect because yeah. I think I can always find something interesting out of them. We're, mm. Eventually, we'll get to Nickelback, and um, I don't even yeah. like Nickelback, so that'll be a really interesting episode. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be me trying to find the positives of Nickelback, but, you know, I can do it. <laughs> if anyone can do it, I think I can do it. i got to say, you know, regardless of public opinion, Nickelback got some tunes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, so anyway, that's yeah. for the... Yeah, That's my, for the Nickelback episode. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my yeah. So yeah, my number three, significant other by Limp Biscuit. Awesome. So here's one that that <laughs> that, that, that might that might raise raise an eyebrow from some Danzig purists. Oh, whoa. Okay. Okay. Okay, so my number two, see, three onward is where my list gets gets interesting mm -hmm. for the number one pick. So, well, this is number two. So for number two, I have gone for Famous Monsters by Graves Era Misfits. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first. You guys, are, you guys are hearing it now first on Cranked and Ranked. I, I, this is my last episode of Cranked and Ranked. I can't be here <laughs> to participate in this bullshit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, this this is the first time that you've mentioned an album that I'm just going to go, no, and I, but I'm going to allow you to speak. <laughs> okay. I've even got it in my notes. <laughs> St Steven's going to get mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've worded it. I'm one of those war criminals that actually likes Graves era misfits. I love Danzig and the songs they made with him. But this record and American Psycho are up there as some of my favorite punk albums and i love they're them probably more. also way better produced i'll give them that yeah yeah the, it's probably the production that does it um i love the more metal production combined with that major key punk songwriting and i like that the album songs are so short but so memorable and great to sing along to you know the great halloween vibes too as you get with most misfits and i gotta say you know these two albums, 
I, I've listened to a lot of Misfits, and don't get me wrong, songwriting wise, consistent pretty much right through. Even with even with Danzig and Graves. Um I haven't really listened to the Jerry Only era stuff nearly as much, but I will say I like what this era brought to the table. I like the I like the way it sounds. I, I think kind of... I think that my my argument over Limp Biscuit could be applied here, where um, <laughs> it's not supposed to be amazing music; it's just supposed to be fun, and yeah. and so I I need to just shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, how how many times have you listened to the to the Graves era albums? Um, I've never listened to any of them fully all the way through. I've heard random songs. I, this is, a, it's a thing that I go back to because I, I am a big fan of being proven wrong and having my mind changed. So yeah. you'll, I'll, I'll always see people posting the music video for like dig up her bones or something like that. Is that a song? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'll always click on it and just go listen. Okay. Maybe this is the time. And I'll listen to it and I go, nope. Cause to me, it almost feels like green day got really big and then the guys, the other guys in Misfits went like, "Oh wait, wait, we were a punk band too. Remember us? Here we go!" And like that's <laughs> it's so it's 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 so like not interesting that I it's hard for me to even it would be hard for me to make it through an album. I'm sure, even if though it's, I'm sure it's probably short. Uh, it's it's I think there's like 20 songs on it, but they're all like, <laughs> oh god, I I I, th- I think they're I think they're all like two minutes and below. So, but yeah, it. I would go as far as to say I'm not well versed in the kind of punk scene. I do need to get more into the 80s hardcore punk kind of stuff and, Mm -hmm. you know, and whatnot. I'm much more of a metal guy than I am a punk guy. And that's probably why I prefer the sound of these records in particular. Um, I do love Danzig era Misfits. Ha- I mean, hand, hands up, but yeah. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to have to say something controversial just because I feel like I'm, I'm going to extend an olive branch over to you. But I mean, <laughs> I guess if, if you would say, um, the, the misfits are overrated in my opinion, <laughs> like the, the dancing era misfits, it's fun music. It's not amazing music. Oh, I think yeah, Danzig yeah. did way better stuff in the first three to four Danzig albums than any misfits album, but that's just my yeah. opinion. So Didn't he do so, um, Sam Hain as well. Yeah, he did. Yeah, Sam Hain's good shit too. But I almost feel like Sam Hain is good, but every time I listen to Sam Hain, as much as I like it, I want I I want to skip over to Danzig One because that's such yeah. a solid fucking good album that I'm just like I like this. Can we move on to you know to Danzig and and maybe skip over to How the Gods Kill because that's a rad yeah. album. But anyway, but so I, I really do think as much as I. I draw a line in the sand about the misfits. At the end of the day, I'm all like, well, no, I, I don't listen to the misfits that much anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> I do like the early stuff and I've liked it for a long time, but I got into it like most people did back in, when I, in, in my age, we got into it because of Metallica. Yeah. So you hear green hell um, and, and uh, fuck a last caress. And the next thing I did was like, Oh, I'm going to go get the misfits collection, which didn't have, um, last caress on it but it had green hell on it mm. and um and so i became i was a fan ever since but that's that's me having an opinion on the misfits while coming at it very late in the game anyway so <laughs> who cares you know yeah i i think um like that i do agree with what you say like oh we're a punk band too shit green day's getting big <laughs> but it it's just the um it's the fact that something sounds pretty metal in production quality but has that kind of major key up tempo upbeat kind of feel mm-hmm. it it just tickles my fancy in there so in in there somewhere so, something's something's turning the cogs <laughs> maybe when it went like i was trying to say with snm maybe i do need to find a way to listen to this and divorce it from the other misfits and then maybe i'll find something in it that i like i'm gonna try that <laughs> Spe- speeding on a moonlit night is pretty good to it i must say right. i picked i i picked a good night to to listen to it uh so i was on my way home from uh work the other day and it was like a full moon and i'm talking like a big full moon mm-hmm. and it was orange and i just thought oh this is sick 
you know, I'm just driving around with this, you know, all of the songs are inspired by bad 50s B-movie horrors. So, and it was coming up for Halloween as well. So it really set the uh, set the tone, but yeah. Nice. Cool. So that pretty much wraps up uh, Famous Monsters by the Misfits. Awesome. Cool. Well, that, that that's, I like where we're going with this because um, we're, we're I, from what I'm gathering about where you're going with your list and knowing where I'm going, we're leaving out some big albums from 1999. There are yeah. probably people listening who are yelling at us. <laughs> um, where but is gonna, it? <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I'm going to, but I, with my number two, I'm going to throw in one that I think is one of those big ones that I think people talk about. Um, my number two is uh, uh, the battle of Los Angeles by rage against the machine. Hey, and uh, this is like I was saying, there's two albums in my list that I consider to be growers mm. because um, this rage against the machine album was one that I, I, I was a huge fan I loved the first Rage album. My favorite Rage album is Evil Empire. And so I was very ready for this. And I remember it was one of those albums where I stood in line at Tower Records at midnight and got this album. Wow. And, and I liked it, but at the time, it, I wanted it to be a, a big step forward from Evil Empire. Because if you listen to the self-titled album and then Evil Empire, I believe that there is a good progression there. Yeah, and it's this like four one, years. The it, this one doesn't have the as big of a progression, but over time, it just it is stayed not only so relevant subject matter wise, but also the sound of Rage Against the Machine. It became it becomes more and more um, uh, obvious that even though there were a whole bunch of other bands trying to do Rage Against the Machine style stuff, nobody sounds like Rage Against the Machine. Mm. The combination of those four dudes, nobody can replicate that. And so at this point, because this is, as, as we're speaking now, the last Rage Against the Machine album of original material, so history, the, the hindsight of it all has made this album become way more important to me. Mm. Um, and it's got its tracks that, you know, you know, you, everybody knows testify gorilla radio. Like those are just killer songs. Once again, Brendan O'Brien uh, behind the boards on this album. That's three, three Brendan O'Brien albums in my list. And, um, this album is just banger after banger. And even though I don't like it as much as the first two, it's still, the there's only three. We only have three Rage Against the Machine albums, mm. and this one is one that, even with a little bit of its shortcomings, I think it loses a little bit of steam kind of in the second half. But it's still a killer band making killer music in a way that only they have been able to do. And as much as I love this band, I don't really want them to do another album. I know they they were reuniting and they were going to do a tour, but COVID kind of sidetracked all of that. Yeah. And I'm fine. I'm fine with that. Um, but I don't know. I, I think I would like this. I almost feel like I wish that they would just start something else and leave the legacy of rage as a machine as it is. Cause it's pretty perfect at this point. I got yeah. to see them. I, I saw them on the tour for this album. Oh, and nice. it was a big stadium show. And one of my favorite concert memories comes from that show. So the 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 last song they play of the night is Killing in the Name. And at the very end of the thing, everyone's on their feet because it's fucking Killing in the Name. And they get to the part where it builds up. And the fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. And all the drums, and it's building up and it's building up and it's building up. And it gets to the point where the beat kicks in and you know, you're, you're revving up to it. And you, you know everyone in that fucking place is fist in the air. Yeah. Fuck you. And as soon as the beat kicks in, all of the lights in the stadium come on. Oh. And all of a sudden, we're all looking at each other, all with our fists in the air, all saying, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. And it felt so fucking good. Yeah. And that still, it still gives me chills thinking about it today. That is just one of those. It was such a tiny thing they did in that song. It didn't take any element. Like they literally just said at this point, turn all the lights on. That was, that was the idea, but it created something 
that just felt so great. Yeah. And 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 it's it's just sometimes you you get those um I I don't know. It, it's it's a, it felt very unifying and um I guess now in hindsight, you know, 20 years later, especially living in America and going through what we've been going through, unifying moments seem to have become fewer and fewer and it just feels good. We uh, we've had we've had a big unifying moment here in America today. Yeah. And um that's that's all I'm going to say about it cuz I don't want to piss people off by getting political, but it feels the same way. It feels like I, I, I'm I what has happened in our country with the election. I feel like I'm in a big room with a bunch of other people and we all have our fists in the air saying, fuck yeah. you. I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> and um, so that's great. But that's but that we're, we're, I'm, I'm kind of sidetracking a little bit. Battle of Los Angeles is a, an amazing album. And um yeah, it's it's just got so many good elements in it, and it's a band just kicking fucking ass. And um, really, Rage Against the Machine is up there with one. Of, I mean, they they're probably not in my top ten favorite bands, but if you were going to ask me what I think some of the most important bands are, they're definitely in that list. Yeah. So um, so yeah, number two, Rage Against the Machine, The Battle of Los Angeles. Yeah, it's it's funny you should say it's a grower album as well because like aside from the first album, it's funny actually. Like Rage's first album has a quality to it that I find that the rest of them don't, and that's immediate. Like it, there's an immediacy to to that first one that that mm-hmm. I feel like the other two or or three if you include renegades um they all have a a grower quality to it whereas that first album just has such a sense of urgency but um, yeah it that was a really interesting time because there was music coming out that too as a young person i would say it was it was music that i felt was new and felt good um the the two two bands that I would lump together in that were, were with that first rage album and the first tool album. When those came out, those were albums that I was just like, this is amazing. And I don't know if I've ever heard anything like this before. Yeah. And so, yeah. So they're, they're, they, they did that. Like they were able to come out of the gate with something that just sounded so not only fresh, but important. Yeah. Like, you know, saying some shit because like a lot of, a lot of groups, even the ones like like really before them, the only there there were groups here and there, like probably Public Enemy would be a really big one, but that's in the hip hop world. In the world of rock, sure, metal bands would do political songs, but but even then lyrically there was always a little bit of a of a what's the word I'm thinking of? It's it felt a middle of the road statement on corrupt government. Whereas kind of Rage Against, um, ambiguous. She, yeah, exactly. Thank you. It, it, it felt, even though it, it, they said important things, it was more done ambiguously. Whereas Rage Against the Machine did not do that. Yeah, and it felt great. Still feels good today. It, it, you find with a lot of those like um, those like old school metal songs that are kind of about politics. It's kind of government did a bad like yeah yeah it's It's never it's never really taking a side on things yeah Um, it's it's just pointing out how things are bad yeah (laughs) there are a few bands that were better at it but yeah cool so yeah this has been an absolute wild ride of an episode uh as i said that my list was going to be a wacky one um so th- this, f- for me, my my top pick, my number one, I place this at number one because while th- the albums beneath it, I-, I feel either they're not my top pick from said bands or they're fun because they're dumb <laughs> yeah this one I feel is 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 an absolute fucking opus of an album and and the work that went into the composition of it is uh, is astounding and so i have gone for i've gone for a for a it'd be a little concept album okay by the by the prog metal legends dream theater oh shit with okay metropolis part two 
scenes from a memory. Wow. You, this is literally, I'm like, I don't even know this album <laughs> because it, I'm not, I'm not a dream theater fan. It's, it's, it's a rewarding listen, dude. Uh, I knew this would likely be my number one right off the bat. This album fucking rules. It, it's this concept album. Each song pretty much runs directly into the next and it has stellar musicianship around every corner Every single member of the band is, is given their all. Mike Portnoy, John Myung, I think that's his name, Myung, Myung. He's, he's yeah, Asian. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, John Petrucci, um, f- fucking Jordan Rudis, and um, even James Labrie. It, you know, they're all really bringing a, an amazing rock opera feel to this. And the Dance of Eternity should be mandatory learning for metal drummers as it has over 100 time signature changes in it. That's Holy an, shit, really? That's an instrumental song. That's the instrumental on, on the album, or at least one of them. And it has you, a, you would think that I would be a bigger fan of Dream Theater because I love Rush so much, and I've always heard them kind of compared to Rush. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, and I know they're all great musicians. I feel like my disconnect with that band has always been the vocalist. I, I've I've always thought he just doesn't he d- doesn't bring enough to the table. Yeah. But once again, I've only heard stuff off of maybe the first two albums they did. I would I would go as far as to say, if there are any albums here, I implore you to 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 go and listen to. It is this one. It's I think it kind of. It's quite it, the theme is quite existential. It kind of follows a man who goes to um, like get hypnotized or something and finds out in a past life he was like this young girl that was murdered, and he kind of has to figure out he has to solve the murder himself. And it's the styles of the songs throughout. I'm actually going to get it up here. Um, regression is really is like this really nice part um and then it goes really proggy with like overture strange deja vu and then it has really soft moments like through her eyes fatal tragedy has an amazing solo at the end of it um and there's just it, it's a perfect mixture of 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 ballads instrumental tracks and straight up fucking rippers and this album is totally 100% worth listening to if if you haven't if you haven't heard it. I, and, I haven't so I, I guess I should. I feel like Dream Theater is a band I'm going to get around to at some point cuz it seems like it's in my wheelhouse so Yeah, it'll it, happen. I would go I would say as well um there's certain like motifs and stuff and melodies and kind of rhythms and sections that appear in the album and then come back later in the album and I love mm-hmm. shit like that and yeah. it links the parts together and it's just this it, you know it, as far as gushing goes I I can't fault this album it is it is so perfectly put together I, I it's a it's a 10 out of 10 record for me wow um, okay yeah, and I do understand where you're coming from with with the vocals, but I think if you look at any prog band, the vocals are always they do tend to come up as like the stereotypical "oh here we go" kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean I, it's funny that the, the 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 thing that I just said about Dream Theater is the thing that so many people say about Rush. Yeah, and I'm I'm always just like you don't like Getty Lee's voice. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> It's, it's like what's wrong with having a unique voice like nobody sounds like getty lee yeah so um we'll get we'll get one of these days and we're, i'm dragging you through the rush discography we're gonna do that shit rush is rush is is how i feel um as i would imagine you would feel about dream theater they're a band that what i've heard i enjoy but i i haven't done such a deep dive that i'm totally familiar with all of their albums yet but yeah. my god what i what I've heard is impressive, but yeah, 
Metropolis Part 2, Scenes from a Memory. Uh, I must preface this by saying, when it says Part 2, there's a song on Images and Words called um, Metropolis Part 1. And um, also the sequel is a whole album as opposed to a song. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, pretty sweet. Yeah. The, um, but they actually never intended for there to be a sequel. They were just kind of like, we're going to, we're going to do a prank on all the prog fans and, you know, say we're going to do a part, part two. And initially when they put that part one on there, it was a little joke like within the band, but then about fucking seven years later, they put out this absolute fucking opera of an album and um yeah and you got i guess you got to give them some credit too for putting out an album like that in 1999 oh yeah and that yeah. was definitely not the flavor of the month but somehow it, it 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 it's one of their most you know renowned and beloved records and yeah as as far as albums go and as far as prog metal goes mm-hmm this is how to do a concept album, you know? Cool. And yeah, that is, that is my number one pick. I, I, I like this. So we're, so we'll get to our, um, our runners up, um, in a minute, but I'm going to wrap this up by talking about an album that we already talked about. Hey. My number one is the album California by Mr. Bungle. Nice. You, and a lot of what you said, I was already about to say, I can't really add a lot more to it. Um, cause you said, you said a word that I was actually going to use was, which is accessible. It is interesting how California is one on one hand, the most accessible Mr. Bungle album, but also if you really break it down, it's also the most complex Mr. Bungle album Yeah, because they hit so many different areas sometimes within just one song. And I, I don't know. It's, I, this album has, has stayed with me over the years and it never ceases to amaze me. It's an album that makes absolutely no sense and absolutely perfect sense at the same time. Yeah. And no other band can do weird the way that Mr. Bungle does weird yep. because a lot of times it either comes across and it's not done very well or it sounds really heavy handed w- yeah. with the weirdness and Mr. Bungle doesn't feel like that. It feels like naturally these dudes are just kind of wacky and have all these ideas and they have the chops to pull them all off. And you, you said it before, it's got like, it's got its chaotic moments. It's got its beautiful moments. It, it really takes you on a journey. Yeah. And it's just the, I don't know, the, the, the product of mad geniuses and it's, Whenever, whenever you he listen to this, and I think about how it's an album that they broke up, kind of because of making it, it makes sense. Yeah, it, 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 it had to have been quite a task, N- not just composing the songs, performing them all, put, p- producing it, and putting all the pieces together in a way that made some sort of sense, and. There are all sorts of little things on the album that they could have left off and it would have still been good. Like little tiny like instruments that pop up here and there and do, you know, one measure of one part of one song and yeah. that's it. And it's just pretty amazing. So it's like, it's, it's, it's always been interesting to me, especially on California, how the songs will sometimes seem to peak and then yeah. that peak is sabotaged by an even better peak. Yeah. <laughs> like you'll just be like, fuck, I was already, I was already ready to call this the best part of the song. And then <laughs> something else comes and hits you in the face. And it's just so great. And one of the things I love though, is that of, of the things that were that, especially me that I've been talking about corn and limp biscuit um, and bands like that, they were all bands that would cite Faith No More as an influence. Yeah. And, and they're kind of jumping off of the music that Faith No More did to do what they did. And then at the same time, Mike Patton is making this. Yeah. He's just like, you guys can have that. <laughs> <laughs> we have moved on to an area where 
it almost feels like an album that exists on its own. I can't think of another album that is like California, but I think mm. the same could be said with all three of the Mr. Bungle. Well, now four, but the newer one, I think you can draw comparisons to stuff, but California is an album that nobody has made an album like it that's as good as it. And it just feels like it's its own genre in itself. Like it's just, this album is California. That's what it is. And if you try to put any other kind of label on it, like we said earlier, you're probably wrong by somebody else's perception of the album. Yeah. Your, your perception is not going to be the same. (laughs) And it's that to me, that's why it's the best album of 99. Cause it's there. Nobody else could possibly even today, you know, if this album came out today, it would be my album of the year because it's, it's, there's, there's, it's, there's nothing like it and it's still amazing. And it's, 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 uh, it's, I can't say anything else about it. It's just amazing. The, the cool thing about this episode is that when this episode comes out, it will be almost like a week long Mr. Bungle celebration that I have, have been doing because <laughs> the episode of Old Headbangers Ball that comes out, I'm going to play a Mr. Bungle video and then I'm putting out a review of the Mr. Bungle album. Hey. And now we're talking about Mr. Bungle on Cranked and Ranked. It has been a, a celebration of Mr. Bungle this week for those of you who, um, if, if some of you out there are someone who actually watched all three, put that down in the comments below of the YouTube video or, or something. Cause I'd like to know who, who listens to all this, <laughs> all my nonsense, but yeah, so that's my number one California by Mr. Bungle. And now I feel like we have an important thing where we do have to talk about some runners up. Um, unless you have anything else to say about Mr. Bungle or California before we move on. I don't, but I just want to make uh, 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 a quick little thing um, that I noticed as of, you know, having some time to really mull over my uh, Alice in Chains list. And I'm not doing a re-edit of my list, but, (laughs) but I will say... After reading, and this is, I am by no means influenced by the, by the people in the comments. I stand by my list. But I've decided, and I knew this before I even went in, I love Facelift and Dirt equally for different reasons. Mm-hmm. And here is, here is what I've found. I've been, I've been really listening to the, both of them and figuring out what, why I like each of them. Facelift has that 80s vibe still hanging around a little bit that I just love. So from a vibe perspective, it wins. Mm-hmm. But fuck me, Dirt is just great song after great song. You know, yep. it, I went back. I, and really- I think I think we were very clear on the fact that 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 those albums that you're it's a close margin with the yeah. two of them. But, but the, it's, real, it, the real question is going to be when are you when is when is the self titled album going to move up further on your list? Because I'm <laughs> that's the one I'm like that one is fucking amazing. That's the thing. Like it, it's I think it could just be the production being an obstacle for for me personally because the yeah. the production on the first four releases just it really elevates their their kind of feel and that kind of that kind of Alice in Chains vibe pre lane totally falling apart and Mm -hmm. you know i mean that in the nicest and most respectful way but um you know but by tripod lane was lane was in a bad bad way sure but you know i've i've got to say those two albums you know for some people facelift is leagues below dirt and I just don't get that personally, but mm-hmm. I can see how if if the eighty sound kind of repulses you a bit, I can also understand why. But sure. yeah, and I, I just wanted to make one last little live edit to my list. I, <laughs> okay. Uh, of this one, actually, I have no fucking idea why California was number four. California <laughs> should have been should have been two. I'm going to swap Famous Monsters in California. 
but um, okay, you heard they, it. you're you're able to do that. I'm not going to let you go back and edit Alice in Chains because that one's in the that one's already in the can, sir. Oh yeah, forever, yeah. Forever, that's your ranking. <laughs> yeah, I will never, I will never violate the sanctity of this podcast. <laughs> um, but no, I'll let you edit it today. So, so Mr. Bungle gets its number two. I, I'm, I, I'm, I approve of this transition. <laughs> But um, but yeah, so we th- that, th- there you go, guys. You got a little added bonus, a little sequel to our Alice in Chains thing. A little, uh, what do you call that? Uh, a uh, callback? Go back. Yeah, a callback. There you go. Yeah. But, but we're still on 1999, and there are some big albums that we didn't talk about. For sure. And a couple of them, I'm not going to talk about all of them, because there are some albums that I know that people fucking love from 99, and I don't think are that amazing. But there are a couple. And so, um, do you, do you have the, some runner ups to mention? Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm a drop them in. So Let's do it. I've, I've got my, uh, iTunes library up as we speak. Uh, okay. So I'm going to have to drop it in. I know you're not the biggest fan of them, but this is the stronger album of their new metal era. I've got to say the burning red by machine head has some tunes on it 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 okay. does it does have that you know dumb but fun feel the the burning red is leagues above supercharger supercharger starts well but it has it's got a lot of filler um mm-hmm. the fragile by nine inch nails that big ass ambitious double album that trent Reznor mm-hmm. made uh yeah it's got some really cool stuff Antipop by Primus, funnily enough, produced by Fred Durst, was it, in part? Um, I think he produced a track on yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, maybe he did other things too, but I, I know that um, that Les Claypool and Fred Durst are, are friends. Yeah. So, which, is, which is always one of those things I'm like, I just want to be in the room when they're hanging out. That's, <laughs> that's all I want. I want those two guys to having a conversation. I want to know what that, what that sounds like. I, I, how much do you want to put money on the on them having gone on a fishing trip together? Oh, that's one. Oh, I, that's a given. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I am one hundred percent with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> also, quick little fun fact as as we're on as we're on a Primus thing, real quick. Have you ever noticed uh, Kirk Hammett in the uh, John the Fisherman video? Yes, he's on yeah. the boat with them. Yeah. I I spent ages trying to pick him out, and I find I figured out it was he's wearing like a blue flannel, isn't he? It's something like that. I think I, I think that is him. But am I wrong in thinking that isn't Jim Martin in that video too? Or am I oh. am I thinking? I don't know why I felt like he was in the video also because they're all they were all buddies. I mean, to be honest, like you know, Jim Jim has that vibe anyway. Yeah. So. But he's also such a distinctive character, so you'd know if you saw him. That's the thing. I don't think he was dressed in the Jim Martin thing. I think he blends in more, but I don't know. I don't know where I got that from, but it just feels like that was a thing. Yeah. Now I come to think of it, I, I do kind of picture him with like a trucker hat on and his hair tied back. So he could well be. He could well be. I'm going to have to pull that one out for another old headbangers ball if I can play it and and look around that video a little bit. That's that's a great. I love that fucking first Primus. Al- the first two Primus yeah. albums are so good. Well, but that, we're not that's not 99. <laughs> I I'm going to go ahead and extend that to the first 3. I I'm a pork yeah. soda boy. I they, that they, they lost me a little bit with that one, but I do still think it's really good. Hell yeah. But that's that's for the Primus one. That's for the yep, Primus episode. Totally. That'll be a good one too. Like, mm, yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> but yeah, cool. So I've I've pretty much. Oh, that's all of your of your honorable mentions. I th- I think the, the 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 rest of the albums that I own from '99 made either my list or your list. Okay. Um, well, I, I've narrowed mine down to five that I that I need to talk about. Um, one that narrowly missed being in my top five is the album Calculating Infinity by the Dillinger Escape Plan. Oh, shit. Um, it is, that's the only full length album with their original vocalist. And I'm not one of those people that hates Greg Puchato or however you say his name. I like the, some of the stuff they did with him also, but 
the brutality of that original vocalist along with the mathematical madness in that yeah. fucking album it it just sounds it sounds scary at times like it could be a horror movie soundtrack something about it sounds menacing it's so like, calculated that it's frightening. <laughs> exactly <laughs> like it, this was this was preemptive I'm going to fuck you up territory. Like <laughs> it is. Yeah. And it, it's a Dillinger escape plan as a whole is a band that it, it, they were an, an amazing band, but this album, just the fact that right out of the gate, they were doing this crazy mathematical metal, hardcore kind of shit that yeah. was kind of unsettling at times. It, it's just, it's so fucking good. But, um, that was almost in my top five. They did an EP with uh, Mike Patton as well. They did. That's a fucking great one too. Hell yeah. Um, and uh, um, so the next one I have to talk about, um, it could be in my top two or three of uh, George Corpse Grinder Fisher era Cannibal Corpse album. The album Bloodthirst ah. is so good. Yeah. And it's so well produced there's so many good tracks on it, but at the, it's, at the end of the day, it's an album that I don't listen to as much. It, it, if we're talking about the Cannibal Corpse discography, this one's probably in the top 10 easily, but um, it didn't, it, it wasn't in my top five. It would be in my top 10 of 99 for sure, but man, that's a fucking great one. And um, now we're going to get on to two, well, um, we'll get there. Uh, let's 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 touch on some new metal again for my last couple. Um, although I have one that isn't new metal. Never mind. I'm gonna stop rambling. Um, Wisconsin Death Trip by Static X. Hey, that album fucking rules. That is one of those albums that at the time I thought Push It was kind of a cool song, but I didn't get into this album until way later, and it is so good that I don't know. I I get why some people are fanatical Static X fans. Because yeah. they were doing a thing that didn't... There were other bands doing similar stuff, like your Power Man 5000s and shit like that. But Static X, like Rage Against the Machine, was a band that I think nobody did this weird, dancey, new metal kind of shit as good as Static X. Yeah. And I love Wisconsin Death Trip. It, it's 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 a, a killer album. And um, yeah. Uh, th- th- I'm sure a lot of people will, will praise it. The next one I want to talk about, we don't even need to talk about because everyone in the fucking world talks about this album when they're talking about 1999, but I have to give it some love because it's from a band that I don't really like. Um, the self-titled Slipknot album came yeah, out that- in 1999. Yeah. And I got it when it came out because in 1999, there was no metal like that happening that was on a big scale, like, yeah. like, um, coming through major labels, M- metal bands that were extreme for the most part have been relegated to indies. They had all lost their major deals and, you know, they were all trying to figure out who they were. And here comes Slipknot where they were so brutal and so tight as a band that it was impossible to not love it when it came out. Yeah. Yeah. It is not in my list because I think Corey Taylor isn't very good as a vocalist and, or as a lyricist and his rapping on this album. Like I, on other, like I, I'm fine with Limp Biscuit, but he sounds like a white boy rapper. Yeah. Everything <laughs> is just like suckers over here and suckers over there. Like he's just so lame <laughs> and his, his, his yelling voice is not very unique. He's fine. He's passable. But the music that Slipknot was making deserves a better vocalist than than Corey. What's his name? Corey Hart? Corey? <laughs> I just I said his name before, didn't I? Yeah, it's Corey, Corey Taylor. Corey Taylor. Corey yeah. Taylor. <laughs> Corey Hart. <laughs> he wears his sunglasses at night. That's all I know about Corey Hart. But... um. Yeah, but I, if, but I, but I, I, can, I have to. What? Go ahead. I was going to say, can you imagine if they all just wore sunglasses instead of masks? Oh, <laughs> dude, that'd be great. 
the other bands have already done that. Anyway, but, <laughs> I, but it's, it, I, I feel it's important for me to talk about Slipknot because I don't really like that band, but I, you, I go back and listen to their self-titled album and I just go, God, this is fucking good. Yeah. It's good. It's got so many good moments on it. And the, the, uh, the moments that I don't like are, are kind of few and far between. Overall, it's, it's insanely, an insanely strong album. Um, and I'm going to wrap up my five uh, um, runners-up uh, just because they're one of my favorite bands, the album Freedom by Suicidal Tendencies. Yeah. Um, not one of their best albums, but I'll take a shitty suicidal album over most other things. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I wouldn't say this album is shitty, but even if they did an album that I thought was shitty, I'd be like, eh, it's still suicidal. I'm kind of, I'm kind of digging this. <laughs> so that's really it. I mean, there were ones that we didn't talk about. The, the, we didn't talk about Testament, The Gathering. Oh, um, shit. Um, coming from me, who's a hip hop fan, um, we didn't talk about Eminem's, uh, debut album, but honestly, I think Eminem on that first album, uh, he, he, there's good shit on it. It's, it shows how good he is, but I think he got his shit together you know, on the next album, but that's for a different podcast, I guess, for people yeah. that want to listen to us talk about hip hop. But, um, overall, like when when I went through the albums, ninety nine was a way more interesting year than I had previously thought. Yeah, I, the same, totally, totally agreed. So, um, but yeah, this was this was a fun a fun discussion about nineteen ninety nine. Do you have anything to add about the year of nineteen ninety nine? Uh, I mean, I was one. Uh. <laughs> so you don't even remember Y two K in the build up to that. <laughs> that I will say. I I would I would say like my earliest memory I is is from ninety nine and that would be I had like this this chocolate birthday cake and it was in the shape of a train. It was a pretty pretty boss ass looking cake, I can't lie. <laughs> like and uh yeah, like I just remember my my grandmother's kitchen had like a real old school look to it before they did a refurbishment and I still remember the old kitchen and there was a lot more wood stuff and it, it's just kind of a nice memory really that that kind of first birthday party like a lot of people i know i have kind of a talent for remembering like ridiculous memories from yeah that so many other people would have erased but i distinctly remember a train cake and i only ever had a train once <laughs> I, I i don't remember anything from being one i think my earliest memory is from when I was four years old and my, me the memory is I went to a preschool that was like a, a, a church preschool. Yeah. Like, you know, you had, you had to go to a mass and then you went to your preschool and you glued popcorn kernels onto letters and yep. shit like that. But I remember there was a record player in, in the classroom and I guess they let us bring in records to play. And I brought in, what was my favorite record when I was four, which was the soundtrack to the Flash Gordon movie by Queen. No way. And all I remember is putting on this, there's a track on the, on that album called football fight. Have you ever seen Flash Gordon? Yep. The, you, the when they're doing the football fight thing, with yeah. the, all of a sudden there's a thing shaped like a football in the room. Why is it even there? Who the fuck knows? And who cares? <laughs> but there's that song. And I remember me and other boys, like we're all essentially moshing, <laughs> in a preschool to the football fight and the teacher being like, you guys need to settle down. I'm like, it's the football fight song, ma'am. <laughs> and that's a movie that has lived on with me. I fucking love Flash Gordon and I love that soundtrack. And that's Queen. awesome. But that's, uh, that's part, I think that's the earliest memory I have is, is, is the football fight song <laughs> in preschool. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my equivalent to that would be like a home movie we've got somewhere of me and my uncle during his new metal phase around this time uh blasting power man 5000 and me just running around his room going yeah! <laughs> I'm you ready to go go I'm ready yeah. to go <laughs> that's a good song too that's got a good little vibe to it yeah wasn't that guy related to rob zombie or something the guy from power man I, I, I have or, no idea. I've, I'm something, afraid. Something like that. There was some nepotism going on in the music <laughs> industry. 
Um, anyway, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so that wraps up 1999. I hope you guys all enjoyed it, and I hope we didn't piss anybody off too much. But I mean, really, if we're going to be talking about Graves era misfits and Limp Biscuit, I'm sure we had a lot of people <laughs> turn. Turn this one off. <laughs> don't, don't forget Risk. <laughs> don't forget Megadeth's Risk. Oh, yeah, Risk and Risk. Man, this is great. I feel very good about what we've done today. Oh, totally. And, and um, yeah, so once again, if you're, if you're listening to this on YouTube, comment down below your favorites of 1999 um, because uh, we, we're, none of us are wrong. This is all our opinions. And um, if somebody came to me and said that Limp Biscuit is a really shitty band, I'd be like, yeah, yeah. And I think Limp Biscuit would be the first guys to agree with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anyway, so um, yeah, that's all I have. Uh, any last words from you? Or are we, we, we good to go? Uh, I am, you know, I am very happy with how this episode went. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I like giving some kind of shit on albums the time of day that they deserve yes i agree i agree that we should just have a an episode where we do our top five albums that people hate that we like that, yeah. that should be one i think I mean, we cl- could we're, clearly we're going to talk about saint anger on that one <laughs> <laughs> i think we could do like a couple actually like in a series like five yeah. maybe not even ranked but just um Hey, check these out, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could call it cranked and revisited. Oh where we where we revisit albums that don't get enough love. That's a good idea. I like that. You heard it here, you heard it here first, folks. Cranked and revisited coming your way summer twenty twenty two. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, so yeah, that's it. We'll, we'll probably be back next time, I believe, with a, another band discography. But I think uh, between Eddie and I, we have talked about how much we enjoy doing these kind of off to the side kind of rankings where we're not necessarily just talking about the same band the whole time because that can get a little bit daunting, especially when yeah. a band has a huge discography. So um, I think we're going to be coming up with other types of ranks to uh, to bring to you guys so i hope you enjoyed this one um and thank you for listening and thank you for watching as always if you're not subscribed to the old head uh youtube channel you should uh, same with eddie sparks on youtube there'll be a link down below in youtube to go to that page and you should should subscribe because i i have it on good authority that a new video is coming out pretty soon yep yep sure it's <laughs> it's, it's it's a big one it's a fucking big one, and that's I shouldn't have done said. this to myself. <laughs> you, you missed my that's what she said. It was a good one. Oh, hell yeah. You said it's a big one. Anyway, so um, <laughs> speaking of big ones, we're going <laughs> to... Um, we're going to, we're going to get out of here. So thank you for, for listening once again, uh, to cranked and ranked and we will see you all again next time. Take us out, Eddie. Later, dude.